Washington to Moscow, New York to Paris, Rome to Jerusalem. The prophecies of the Bible are being fulfilled. Stand by for J.R. Church and today's Prophecy in the News. There's some unusual things going on today in Christianity, especially concerning the study of eschatology, the doctrine of last things. We have people in uh, the last 20 years or so who have changed their theology from believing in a pre-tribulation rapture to various and sundry other methods of the rapture and resurrection. Some believe, for example, in a split rapture. Others believe in a... Uh, mid-tribulation rapture, and some believe in a post-tribulation rapture that the church will go through the tribulation period. And we seem to have that same thing happening in First and Second Thessalonians. Now, what is so interesting and important about this, these two books is that they contain the foundation of the study of eschatology for Gentile Christianity. They were written to the Thessalonians, to Gentiles, and they are the earliest of the Apostle Paul's books, dating somewhere around 51 A.D., maybe as late as 54. But it's a fascinating study here, and Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me a review of First Thessalonians. Gary? J.R., today we'll begin by looking at First Thessalonians and maybe comment a little on the second epistle, and then in our next broadcast we'll talk more deeply about Second Thessalonians. This book... Uh, it features the catching away of the church. That's its centerpiece. 1 mm -hmm. Thessalonians 4.16 and following. Yes. And I think most people are familiar with those verses. That's the, uh, the subject of the writing. And what's interesting is that this is his first epistle. This is Paul's first epistle. As you say, written somewhere between AD 51 and 54. It's differently mm -hmm. dated, but yes. very, very early. The fascinating thing about this is that he starts off with his very first epistle written to Gentiles to talk to them about the blessed hope, the resurrection and rapture of the saints. Mm -hmm. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he calls this a mystery, something that was not yes. in the Old Testament, revealed in the Old Testament, but is revealed in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Now, 1 Thessalonians, of course, the foundation verses that we're referring to is, mm -hmm. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the foundation. And here in His opening teachings to Gentile Christianity, this is the thrust of his message. Mm -hmm. His message here is actually threefold, but those three parts, Gary, go together. They you really cannot do. separate the three, can you? And in fact, this is a very important uh, aspect in the study of, I think, prophecy, of eschatology, mm -hmm. the subject of salvation. I'm going to read uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where Paul writes, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Uh, J.R., he mentions here a work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. Mm -hmm. This is salvation, but it's in three tenses. The work of faith is salvation past, that is, when we were justified from the penalty of sin uh -huh. by the finished work of Christ. The labor of love is salvation present, elsewhere in this book called Sanctification, yes. where we are continually saved from the power of sin. We're sanctified. But the patience of hope. Now there is the third part, the future tense of salvation, which in which time, at which time we will be glorified with Christ and saved from the very presence of sin. Now this is salvation in Paul's mind. He always thinks of it as past, present, and future. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. And I think you really have to understand that to understand how he looks at the catching away of the church. And uh, to me, Gary, this is the theme throughout the book. Uh, take, for example, verses 9 and 10 of this same chapter, where he says, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, 
and to wait for his son from heaven. Mm -hmm. We have those same three tenses right there. We sure do. Saved from the penalty of sin when they turn to God from idols. Saved from the power of sin when they serve the living and true God. And saved from the presence of sin, future tense, when they wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus, listen to this verse, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Mm. That's a pre-tribulation rapture, Gary. Yes, it is. And what's more, he's talking to people living in the middle part of the first century, J.R. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And he's saying, we, our job, is, having been saved, is to work the work of faith and to wait for the Son. Now, this is a very early teaching. Who has delivered us. That's past tense, by the way. So yes. it doesn't mean that you can lose your salvation and suddenly you're going to have to go through it or that you're not good enough and so you're going to have to go through the tribulation or at least a certain part of it in order to be purified. He says, I, I'm convinced that he means that when, when, we, when we walk the aisle or when we turn to God from idols, uh, when we got saved, that settled it right there. Absolutely. And we are going to be saved uh, from the wrath to come. Now the wrath to come, of course, is the subject of the prophets. The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. The time when he comes to judge the wicked. Um, he goes on to say in verse 19 of chapter 2, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Hmm. Excuse me for a moment but mm -hmm. for interrupting, but isn't he saying to those Thessalonican believers in about A.D. 51 yeah. that they could be in the presence of Jesus at his coming? Yes. At that time. That's right. And what is, what's so important to us is to, we, we want you to understand he taught a pre-tribulation rapture in 1 Thessalonians. And by the time we get to 2 Thessalonians, some of the folks have jumped out of the boat. They mm. thought the tribulation had begun already, and they were still there. Yes. Now, we have verse 13, for example, of chapter 3, that talks about, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What does it mean, with all his saints? Well, we have in verse 14 of chapter 4, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now the question I think that was stirring the minds of these people in Thessalonica was, what are we going to do with our folks who have already died? By the way, that, I believe, augments the point uh, that I would like to make, and I'm sure you would too, that, that in Paul's day, middle part of the first century, he had so convinced these, these Thessalonican believers in the imminency of Christ's coming that he left town, he went down to Athens for a while. He was unable to go back, as it says in this book, because Satan hindered him. And he had to send Timothy back. But in this interim period after he left Thessalonica, uh, perhaps some of the believers there who were waiting for the coming of Christ had died and been buried. And the ones who were left said, uh, were saying to themselves, well, wait a minute. What about these who have died? Uh -huh. What's going to happen to them at the coming of Christ? Uh, Paul didn't talk about that when he was here. So they are earnestly concerned. Timothy visits Paul and brings this report. And it's perhaps this that prompts Paul to address the question of what's going to happen to those have, who have died. But what it really tells me is that the, the Thessalonians really had a sense of the imminent soon coming of Christ, even in their own day. Mm -hmm. uh, this is important. Paul did not write to them and say, the Lord is going to come in a couple thousand years. He did not write to them and say, the Lord's going to come in 500 years or 200 years. Mm -hmm. he, he talked to them as if the Lord would come any time. You see, Jesus had said to the disciples just before he went away, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. So first century Christianity uh, was blinded to the uh, concept that Christ would not come until after 6,000 years of human history. Mm -hmm. Or that uh, the church would grow for 2,000 years before the Lord would return. It could now, don't misunderstand me. 
uh, there were teachings about the day of the Lord even then. But since Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, they had laid aside that uh, concept of Judaism, evidently, uh, that the Lord would come back at the end of the sixth millennium. We do have Peter referring to uh, the day of the Lord uh, being a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. Mm -hmm. But that refers to the time when Christ will sit upon the throne of this world and rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. For him to come the, for the seventh millennium, uh, that had been taught, I'm sure. But since Jesus had said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, they had put that out of their mind. In fact, he refers to this in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall cometh as a thief in the night. In other words, nobody knows when he's coming. That's basically what he's saying. So I've no need to write to you concerning this. We just don't know when he's coming. He could come tonight. He could come next week. He could come next month. He could come in 2,000 years. He didn't know when, and he was telling these people that they didn't know when, because the night would come before the thief comes. That's what he's saying here, I think. The night will come before the thief comes. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, it's uh, well known by all that when, when a thief plots and plans to do his work, he usually picks that time of the night to arrive when he thinks he'll have at least uh, a chance of being spotted. So maybe he would come at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning. and, and yeah, uh, the Certainly eye, not 6.30 in the evening. No, not in the evening, not the night before. He's going to come when he thinks he won't be seen. And this illustration then is used, I think, to graphically say that uh, when it happens, it's going to catch you by such surprise you won't believe it. You won't have time to blink yeah. unless... <laughs> unless you're one of the children of the day. Yeah. And in, in Which that, means we're going to be gone before the night comes. Yeah, because, and, then to, and to those people, Paul says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you because mm -hmm. you're not going to be there. That's the way I take this. Now, please understand that this is the reason why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. The tribulation period is going to be a dark time in world history. It's going to be the night time of God's wrath. Well, we're gone before the night falls. We don't leave it. We don't leave out 30 minutes after dark. Isn't that what it's saying, Gary? That's right. We don't leave out 30 minutes after dark. We leave out when the sun is still shining, before the darkness comes. And so we are children of the day, not of the night. Mm -hmm. And what he's, he's not saying here that we're going to know the day and the hour before it occurs. That's not what he's saying here. He is saying that the thief comes in the night. We're talking about political darkness. We're talking about economic darkness. We're talking about world situations so bad that, uh, that a third of the population or a fourth of the population or as some consider a half of the population of the planet will die during this time. We're talking about worldwide war and all of the uh, judgments of the book of the Revelation and we're not talking about the last three and a half years here either, Gary. We're talking yeah. about all seven years. Before the night falls, we're children of the day. We're out of here. You know, darkness has a metaphoric idea attached to it. Uh, missionaries who used to go to Africa, China, Indonesia, mm -hmm. various places, uh, and set up missions referred to those places that they went as dark places. For example, darkest Africa or mm -hmm. darkest whatever, you know, darkest Peru, you know, it, because they always said the light of God has not reached into those places yet. We're going to go in there and, and bring the light of God and those places will no longer be dark. Mm -hmm. Well, J.R., some have said that today we live in a, almost a post-Christian era when Christianity has expanded and mm -hmm. now darkness is closing in again. Uh, and, and you know, Gary, some people say we're at one minute till midnight. Yeah, that's true. I say the sun hasn't set yet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now let's face it, folks. Now I realize that literary um, uh, authors have written that the 19th century, the 100 years ago, was called the Darkling Plain. And now 
We are in the midnight hour. But the scripture says we're children of the day, that we will not know the darkness, that the darkness will not descend. And by the way, no matter how dark it looks like it's getting politically, you ain't seen nothing yet. Mm. It's going to really get bad when the Antichrist arises upon the world scene. I realize we've been through birth pangs of travail. We've seen nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We have seen earthquakes continually. Uh, we, we see uh, disease rampant on every hand. But the night has not yet fallen. We're still in the day, Gary. Another way to put that is that the wrath has not been revealed from heaven yet. Yes. And by the way, here in, sec in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, after he uh, concludes this uh, discourse on light and darkness, telling us that we are children of the day, he says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to say about this is that we are to obtain salvation. This is written to believers mm -hmm. who are already saved. And yet he says, you're going to obtain salvation. There is that salvation future, that the future time of the arrival of, uh, of Christ for his saints, he comes, he brings with him those who have died and who, have, who are safe in Christ. And th at that time, we shall obtain salvation. And this will be a real salvation from the very presence of sin. Our, the final tense, salvation future. Yeah, the translation of the body. Right. For this mortal must put on immortality, and this corruptible must put on incorruption. Now, we're looking here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we know that we are going to be caught up when the Lord comes. He descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and he brings the dead in Christ with him. In other words, their souls are going to be reunited with the body, and then they, they're going to rise, then we're going to be translated in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, we'll be caught up together with them to go to be with the Lord. Meanwhile, or immediately after that, darkness descends. That's the way I see it. This is distinctly a pre-tribulation rapture. For some strange reason, when the bearer of this, possibly Timothy, gets to Thessalonica with this epistle, he finds that some of the people think that the darkness has already descended, mm -hmm. that we are already in the day of the Lord, that the Antichrist has arisen. Uh, some of them have quit their jobs and are ready for the rapture. That's true. It's, a, it's, it's an incredible scenario. But we see that today, Gary. I was talking with a friend recently, and he said, all my life I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. But he says, now I'm convinced that the church will have to be purged, purified, go through the fire. I don't see that in the Scripture. And the Apostle Paul grappled with that same situation as he approached 2 Thessalonians. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, he refers to the resurrection and uh, the rapture of the saints, the translation of the living, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Mm -hmm. When we get over to the next epistle, Paul had to turn around and write back to them as soon as the, uh, I guess, Timothy gets back and he says, I delivered this first epistle. And I found some of those people have already begun to misunderstand. Some of them had quit their jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that sound familiar today? Date setters, I guess. Yeah. Quit so their jobs. Say, hey, you can buy a, something on time and you won't even have to come finish the payments before the Lord comes. You don't need to work. Yeah. Now, we don't know what could have happened during that time to cause them to, um, to think that way. But please understand that these are Gentiles who have no basics in Judaism. They do not understand the Mosaic Law. They do not understand the prophets of the Old Testament. What they know, they have been taught by the Apostle Paul. But up until then, they came out of um, Greek mythology. Hmm. They That's knew true. nothing they about were, they were the pagans. Bible. 
Now the first uh, letter, J.R., 1 Thessalonians has as its centerpiece subject the catching away of the church. 2 Thessalonians has as its centerpiece the day of the Lord featuring the man of sin whom we know as the Antichrist mm -hmm. and featuring a uh, so what some people call an apostasy or a falling away. But taken as a pair, these two letters speak of the relationship between the catching away and the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they are beautiful. Uh, by the time you get to Second Thessal Thessalonians, Paul is arguing vigorously that the believer will not experience the day of the Lord. He yes. carries his argument to an even higher level. What could have happened? What could have happened to these Thessalonians? Who came and taught them that they were going to go through the tribulation period? Is it possible, and we don't know, my Bible says A.D. 54. There are other theologians who say A.D. 51, 50, 51. We don't know exactly when, but is it possible that Nero had arisen to the uh, throne in Rome Please understand, Kaiser Nero or Caesar Nero has a numerical value in um, Roman numerology mm -hmm. of 666 to his name. Now, is it possible that that doctrine was, was already being taught to the Thessalonians? Is, we don't have it until, we don't have it shown until we get to Revelation chapter 13. But it's, it's possible that Nero had ascended the throne, which history says he did in, the, in A.D. 54. And when they saw him, Mr. 666, come to the throne, they thought, oh, the Antichrist is already here. He's just arisen, and it looks like the day of the Lord has come, and this is it. Is it possible, Gary, that that's what caused these people to jump out of the boat of the pre-tribulation rapture and suddenly decide, well, we're going to have to go through at least a part of the tribulation? It's very possible, J.R. Maybe that's about half the picture. Maybe the other half is that there were those who seized upon the opportunity uh, to point at something that happened in that time and say, you see, this is it, this is it, we're, mm -hmm. we're here. Maybe a great persecution took place yeah. and uh, an evil persecutor uh, manifested himself and a false teacher came in, pointed to that man and said, hey, this is happening because we're in the day of the Lord and the people started to believe that. Yeah. Now, we want you to understand that 1 Thessalonians says simply that these people in the first century did not know the times or the seasons, but be assured we are children of the day, not of the night. Therefore, we're going to, we're going to be out of here before the night falls. We'll be back in just a moment. Prophecy in the News is America's leading prophetic monthly newspaper featuring biblical studies and news items of interest to the student of Bible prophecy. We'd like to send you Prophecy in the News free for the next six months. After receiving your six free newspapers, you may decide without obligation to continue at the normal subscription rate of $18 per year. Call toll-free today. The number is 1-800-475-1111. Prophecy in the News. Now, you can order Prophecy in the News on VHS videotape each month. Our weekly television program has long been available to our friends on audio cassette tape through our Tape a Month Club. But now, you can view each telecast simply by ordering it on VHS videotape for your gift of $20 each. Or, you can join our new VHS Tape a Month Club and receive 12 VHS videotapes for your offering of $200. Call 1-800-475-1111. Today. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul addresses this idea of the day of the Lord and when this wrath of God comes to fall upon an unbelieving world, which we have played out in the 22 chapters of the book of the Revelation. He makes a reference to this revelation. He makes a reference to the angels that blow the seven trumpets and the, and the seven vials of wrath. Um, this is a powerful verse. Listen, please. Gary, read us chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians, mm -hmm. verses 6 and 7. Let's talk about verses it. Verses 6 and 7, he says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them 
that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Rest with us. So in the time of the revelation of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which is the title of John's last book of the Bible. Yeah, that's right. We are resting. And those who troubled us, God is going to recompense tribulation to them. Mm -hmm. He is saying this to the Thessalonians because he is saying, yes, the tribulation period could occur in our generation, but it hasn't yet. That's what he's saying. And when it does yeah. come, you and I are going to be resting with Christ. And we have here in verse 7 of chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians the very title of the last book in the Bible. In the Greek, it's Apocalypse to Kuriu Yezu, the revelation of the Lord Jesus. And what, we, what that is is literally the name of the book of the Revelation, mm -hmm. uh, which is sometimes called the Apocalypse, uh, yes. from the Greek term, Apocalypsis, which means the unveiling or the revealing. And uh, of course, the subject of the book of Revelation is, the, is Jesus acting through the angelic ministry to bring judgment to planet Earth. Right. So in verse 7 here, we have the word revealed, which is the Greek word apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And we have the revelation of the Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. um, which is the same as the first verse of Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah with his mighty angels, according to verse 7 here of 2 Thessalonians, and his mighty angels are those who blow the trumpets and pour out the vials of wrath. Absolutely. And this, we are resting. And we are, he says, you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. He goes on to say with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, verse 8, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are we going to be when this flaming fire of vengeance is poured out upon the earth? We are going to be resting with Christ. Folks, please, that's a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know any better way to say it. And yet some of the people here, as we will get on into our study in our next broadcast about uh, this, this frustration they had with the day of the Lord, they were shaken in mind, they were troubled that the day of the Lord had already come. Perhaps Mr. 666 had ascended the throne in Rome, Kaiser Nero, and Claudius, uh, the Roman emperor, had been poisoned. And the people are probably, probably are saying, uh-oh, we have arrived, and we are still here. Next week, this is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.